Hello and welcome to the Aviation Briefing with me, William Hallowell. In this podcast series, I speak with media and industry guests about the biggest stories and topics in aviation. Today, I'm joined by Alex Binks, who is the Managing Director of Av Placements. He's also an engineer and ops manager. And we're going to be talking about recruitment and retainment, which is a big topic in the aviation industry. Uh, there's a lot of chatter about how we're going to address this post-COVID. And um, Alex is here to answer some questions on those. Right, so uh, thank you very much for joining Thanks me today, me. Alex. No, thank you. So my first question, I suppose, to you would be, you know, we hear a lot of talk about post-COVID in the industry across many different sectors, whether it be passenger recovery or, you know, those sorts of things. But in terms of recruitment and retainment, I mean, it's kind of been well documented now that globally we have seen, you know, a, a, a big number of aviation professionals who were potentially in the industry for, you know, their, their careers and then they lost their jobs or they were furloughed or aspects like that and have never rejoined the um, no. the industry. So in terms of I mean, where we're at now, I mean, what's your assessment of the industry's kind of struggle to recruit, but also, you know, retain those staff post-pandemic? Yeah. I think it, aviation has always been one of those um, glamorous uh, and, and um, you know, highly skilled and professional sectors where it is very open to the market fluctuations, whether it be war, oil costs, you know, um, uh, financial crisis. Uh, and pandemic, evidently, um, you know, it's been one of the first things that suffers is the connectability with other parts of the world. Um, and obviously, the knock on effect it has to everything in that chain. Um, obviously, now we're into 2024. Um, you know, three years on, I would say, from the time when things really started to wake up. Um, it's been difficult to bring people back to the sector. I mean, there's obviously a passion by the longstanding uh, professionals that wish to come back. Um, you know, it's in your blood. You can't you can't shake it. Uh, people have tried other things during that time and evidently had to diversify, um, uh, which is reason why we started in the first place. Um, you know, my, my team was made of uh, aviation professionals that got affected by the pandemic and used their transferable skills to access other areas uh, within infrastructure, rail, supply chain, medicine, uh, you name it. Uh, and it really shows the diversification of these people. Um, but obviously, as we speak, you know, the market is uh, difficult in regards of finding the once able to be easily attained skill sets, because I think a lot of people have retired uh, early or uh, taken early redundancy, evidently redundancy can't really help but take. Uh, but, you know, they've taken that opportunity for the last four or five years of their career with a huge uh, insight into their particular areas of, of sector and have gone and just done something else. Um, and the, the wanting to come back is almost gone because they found other things to progress on with and said, I've had my time there, which then presents the problem of who comes in behind them. Um, and uh, it's one of these things where, Again, STEM facilities, um, we've mentioned this before, um, talking ourselves outside of this, um, we, with the, you know, we need to invest as a country in these you know, opportunities to diversify into aviation with, with similarly transferable skills, whether it's engineering, it's, it's health and safety, it's operations, it's, it's commercial, it's sales, um, it's supply chain, you know. The, the, there's so many exciting opportunities available right now. The industry is in this circumstance where there are jobs aplenty, but people aren't necessarily aware of what those jobs could be for them in their future career paths, or they haven't got the, the right certifications or, or, or um, you know, uh, qualifications to be able to, to fill those roles in, in quick succession. Um, we're starting to see now companies and clients diversify in the way that they attain um, and they're looking at sort of fast tracking or um, pathways, as it were, to getting to qualified uh, individuals to, to recoup what, what the industry overall has lost. Um, so it's, it's an interesting time because I think everyone's expectations are to still be able to just get on a plane and fly or to be able to send that parcel to America or to uh, the Middle East or wherever they wish to go. Um, but, you know, they forget actually who's going to be taking it there, who's involved in that process, and are those people interested in working in that environment, uh, whether it be pilots, crew, engineers, supply chain, ops, you name it, um, ground handling. It, it's one of those where um, it's, it's a difficult time to find people with the previously 
proven experience, but it's an exciting time to be able to create opportunities to to attract people into what is quite an exciting sector. And it, it's a, it's an amazing sector. It's, there's nothing like it else really uh, that you can explain, you know, when you think about an aircraft over 200 tonnes flying through the air at God knows how many miles an hour and there's a 300 people sat on board it in comfort. And you're thinking of all the people and all of the different you know things that took part to make that happen you know there's a hell of a lot of jobs to be had it's just um opening people's eyes outside of the sector to bring them in and in terms of then those people that we have lost and as you say haven't been able to attract to come back because they've found other career paths i mean would you say that it's caused a, a skill gap not just a, an issue of numbers you know the number of people we have in industry but also losing that talent and the experience that those people who did leave the industry as a result of the coronavirus pandemic you know we haven't been able to get it back and even you know yeah. those the younger people that have come in or new people not just young mm. people uh it, it has caused um you know issues absolutely across industry. I, I think i think there's two things to consider there is one the availability of facilities in order to train people in the first in the first instance um, there's been a massive contraction in where you can go to be able to be qualified in certain areas of the market, uh, whether it be flight training, engineering, um, airfield operations, um, civil engineering, customer service. Um, yes, there are colleges around that supply. Um, there are flight schools that are, uh, you know, um, sort of clumped together into larger groups of brand that, that provide packages. Um, but the, the entry level to sort of piloting is extremely high. Um, the longevity and the weight, you know, the, the length of time it takes to become a, a licensed aircraft engineer uh, is probably you're looking at for a fully feasible engineer with good on jet experience to be able to start certifying as a B1 or B2 license. You're looking at seven years from scratch. Um you know, the other aspects are pilots. Yes, you might be able to produce a pilot in 18 months on a fast track, um, high intensity course, but it's going to take them many months, if not years, to to fulfill the, you know, the criteria of a comfortable, you know, um, FO or comfortable senior first officer. Not that the skill or the training isn't there from the beginning, but it's the experience that they've had of flying in that aircraft for that amount of time and coming across those different circumstances. Um, I think one of the other issues is the obviously we, we can't ignore it, the pandemic and Brexit. Um, Brexit has obviously created uh, an issue with EASA and the CAA, as many people are fully aware. And it means obviously now that we are a civil aviation authority, the licensing has changed, which then limits certain people to making a decision on whether they're going to be EASA or CAA. Um, and it's it's a conundrum. Because you'll have ERs of qualified people that can't work a CAA aircraft or a CAA particular role unless they convert. And the conversion is who's funding that conversion? Who, who's going to, when they've already put time and effort into getting those qualifications, who's going to have to revisit going over that again just to make it one or other uh, in order to find you know employability? Um, so there's a lot of questions that, that are being asked of you know um, employers you know what can you do to help me how can we diversify where can we look to take new um, and uh, alternative skill sets to, to speed this skills gap up and I've used this analogy before but it effectively is like a lava lamp isn't it where you know you've got that bubble of uh, people in a, a particular age group with all of that skill set prior to the pandemic that stayed within or have come back in the last couple of years and it's rising through that lamp and then you're waiting with this massive gap before the next bubble to come which would be the STEM facilities the flight training schools the engineering engineering you know license courses and, and 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 so on and so on and operations uh you know courses within universities or or with an hnd or something like that um it's one of those where you know there's so many ways that we can attack this issue but it's who who's going to take the first steps forward you know i can see clients are making an, uh, an effort to create courses that mold people into the areas they need which is Fantastic. Investing in the people, the, the, the candidates, the professionals find, you know, um, a great you know, appreciation of that. They feel like actually I'm going there not just as a number, but they are going to give me something off the back of this. Um, and I don't think it's a race to the top in pay in, in everything. Um, I think a lot of people have sort of assessed over the pandemic. What do they want out of life? What do they want really? Is it is it you know diversification? Is it education or is it more money? Um, naturally, with a, a nicheness and a shortage of skills comes a demand which pushes prices up. So that's just market trend. But you know, I think a lot of people have been asking us, what else can I gain from coming to this person or this client or this company? And it's a lot about 
what can they add in certification or qualification or diversification what they've done for years um and uh, I, I think that's something that we're getting to you know we, we, we you know some companies are quicker to react than others um i think there's this uh let's say an uh an expectation that brands are big enough that they should be able to attract the right people brand alone um i and that's not to dis discredit any brand um and you know we have a brand ourselves uh but you know to reach out to people we certainly as our brand we don't headhunt anyone um, they actually come to us looking for support um and advice because you know most of the people that work here have worked in the industry for at least 18 to 20 years in format in different formats you know so it's one of those where we offer sound advice as best as we can give with the experience we've got on top of the recruitment services that we provide but you know a lot of people are coming to us saying what can this company do for me i'm looking to diversify i'm looking to progress and it's not necessarily about the paycheck so there's a few different things government needs to sort of contribute to investment in um early careers and skill sets um you know there needs to be when you look at the airfields we have around the uk um there's a you know lots of people started to diversify and use um slightly less large airfields to operate out of uh, more you know opportunities to link the west country the northeast you know um with europe and and, and the greater you know the greater world in, in in international flying and so there needs to be stem facilities and, and and aviation academies uh that are near to those those hubs in order to be able to help promote um people coming into the sector and not just training uh being reliant upon companies bringing those people into the sector and, and footing the bill themselves in an already cost competitive market um so there's there's it's a, it is it is a massive conundrum um i think there are some people that are, are trying to lead the way which is good um it would be good to see the government putting uh, i know they are um it's a it's a tough time for everyone at the moment but it will become even tougher if we don't have a backfill in the skill shortages that we're seeing at the present um because evidently the price will knock on to everything from freight uh, travel um you know salaries uh, you name it it will it, because it becomes so niche which is lovely to be appreciated for that but i think you know we need to be looking at the long term prosperity of and growth of the com uh, of the country by actually improving those services um and and having those people working in those services uh, that we sometimes take for granted as a passenger getting on a plane to go visit family or, or or for business um so like i say you know th there's a multitude of reasons why but i think some of it has been the separation of EASA and caa um the shakeout of soon to be retirees from the sector um because of the early uh, redundancies due to the covid pandemic and not being able to pass that skill set on and hand it over to the next you know um a cohort coming in because it was cut short so abruptly um and again you know you're looking at the uh sort of the demand for travel is is spiking it's, it's gonna i believe exceed um last year again this year with demand but then again if there's no people or not no people but if there's less people and they're expected to cope with that demand it's going to impact services and operations for for all that's involved really in regards of delays or or, or constraints or, or or cancellations even as we're seeing in some airlines where they, they they're crewing and their their um you know uh their flying schedules are affected by the resource that they have and, and the flying time arrangements that they have with with the agreements with crew pilots engineers you name it so it's um it's it's a complicated issue but there are people that are willing to come into this um you know that, that we, we're seeing people that have always found the, the sector fascinating and there is a uh, it is a, a marvelous place to be in um it's so unlike most jobs in the world where there's so many varieties of role to be involved within the sector that can contribute to the overall delivery of an airfield or the the economic benefits to a local community uh, when you look at the impact of what happened with um, the COVID pandemic and how it affected Gatwick, uh, probably was one of the hardest um, economically affected areas in the UK at one point I read in the newspapers because so many people worked in some format for or with or in the airport um, and the knock-on effects of um, houses of multiple occupancy and, and lessers and, and, and tenants and, and you know, shops and, and and services provided to people who lived in those towns around it that, that were knocked on because there was no money coming in because the airport had to cease uh, effectively flying. Um, 
you know, it, it really does show that if we restrict the amount of people or don't appeal to the right amount of people to come into our sector, no matter where the location of the airfield is, you are going to see an economic impact in not just that area, but overall as a contribution to GDP. So I think, you know, the government do need to look at, um, you know, vocational qualifications within air, air, airfields more so um, and, and and airlines and aerodromes and, and air traffic and, and engineering, you know, um, and I, I do think that, you know, the government needs to sort of come forward with some kind of plan because during the pandemic, Grant Chaps, um, uh, you know, it's a difficult a difficult time to to probably be a politician in that time anyway. But I, I think that, um, you know, there was no clarity in, in where our sector was headed. Um, you know, there were support packages for some and not for others uh, in regards of companies within the, in the sector. Um, and, you know, we really need to, be, if we want to have a, a, a growing and prosperous Britain, I think that aviation, you know, uh, it should, it plays a huge part in that, especially with our our, our global foot, you know, footprint and, and where we want to be a part of and support and trade um, and represent, you know, um, whether it be, you know, using big brands that help with Olympics or with national sports or, or things like that. You know, there's a lot of people behind what makes that happen. And if we don't have them, it's going to be harder and harder to uh, to, to, to keep those sorts of things, in, you know, moving, as it were. So in your view, um, you know, I, I've spoken to people who have similar businesses to yours. I spoke to one um expert who has a company that trains and and recruits as well yeah. um, and he estimates that as a result of um coronavirus and, and the pandemic that in the uk at least when it comes to ramp operations um the the industry has lost about forty six thousand people i mean what's yeah. your assessment of that is it i, I agree much I, I wouldn't know by the, the exact figure um but i would certainly say that i've recognized that absolutely um i think there's been obviously we, we, again we can't deny the um the, the separation in in um in how we we allow um workers to be able to to transfer between europe and the uk has been a, a big impact um, I've seen, you know, obviously the the salaries rise in order to to create um, sort of uh, an appetite for wanting to work in in such areas of, of the sector. Um, there are huge opportunities within that sector, um, you know, in regards of where you can start from and where you can achieve or, or go to. Um, it's you know again it's not a, a, a been highly sung or praised in in you know in many areas of of the uh, uh, employment sectors that you know that, that these are you know highly skilled roles you know you you have to be trained you have to be uh, certified in particular usage of equipment you have to have airside passes or, or be able to achieve an airside pass um you know that the the operational understanding you get the customer interaction um, you know, there's things that you, you can do which will appeal to uh, people to come into these types of roles. But the, the, again, as we mentioned before, it's what what can it take me to? Where can it lead? What is the pathway? And previously, it's been quite a shallow pyramid in regards of what those roles could lead to. Um, but now you could diversify into operations, you could diversify into supply chain, you could diversify into, um, you know, uh, customer, you know, customer orientated business to do with logistics um, and, and interfacing with, you know, new clients and gaining new clients. Um, you know, the, the impact of, of poor uh, support for ground handling in regards of not enough people being in that sector to begin with. Again, impacts on you know service schedules of airlines and and, and freights. Um, you know, it's 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 an under undervalued, highly um, involved job um, that does need to you know sort of have its praises sung because you know uh, we've all been there when we realise our baggage isn't on the plane and we've had to have our you know um, our, our stuff sent on a later flight potentially uh, because of one or other reasons um, and you know you think that there's a huge amount of people and opportunity for people to join the market and work their way into the aviation sector from such entry points as, as that um, so it's it's hard to attract people um, because obviously digitalization more hybrid working um, of all sorts of roles outside of aviation and within that, that attract people to say actually I don't want to you know be a part of that I'd actually have a, an opportunity here instead it's very difficult to bring people back into those roles without showing them what else can be brought in with qualifications 
education um, and and career pr progression uh, that can be in these 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 sorts of key roles within the airfield. So, I mean, when you mentioned forty six thousand, it's um, yeah, I, I would agree on those sorts of figures in regards of when you think about across all the airfields, um, uh, you know, and freight hubs that that require these sorts of skill sets that are are crying out for people um, to, to 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 support them because it is a valid uh, valid and valued part of the the sector which is is not really sung about too much so in terms of i mean you mentioned younger people it's not just about new people but as you say you know mm. the kind of people who have you know left the industry and took redundancy and have now retired um mm. those those numbers have to be replaced by younger people i mean what can the industry do because aviation is kind of famously uh, a bit of an old boys network you know um i think the older end of you know the kind of demographic for the industry they kind of it, a lot of people tell me that you know it's it's an issue of you know they fear change um what can the industry do to recruit younger people and get them interested um and isn't this potentially you know quite a significant barrier i i think the ba the barrier uh, absolutely is a fantastic um question and point made uh, i think you know, there's a multitude of barriers. I think if you're looking to reach out to the younger demographic, it can't be necessarily only open days. Open days don't really give a sense of um, where you can go. Yes, you can talk to the people that are in those sectors. I agree. And, and, there's, and it excites, absolutely. Um, but when you're looking to imprint a, an opportunity on someone, in the in the nicest of possible ways. For instance, you know, careers days at schools and colleges that excite people, and 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 you go to them rather than having open days in in hotels as such and things like that. Because a lot of those, you know, younger generation can't commute to the places that these things are being hosted at, and it's the same predicament with if they go for training. Where do they go for training if they haven't got a facility in a bus or a train uh, or able to be dropped off to? Um, you know, you, you're stifling a sector based upon the locations of where these training facilities are. Now, the existing facilities will obviously provide people to the sector, but there aren't enough of them around the UK that draw people into municipal airports as well as commercial airports. So there does need to be a focus on um, approaching colleges and schools for careers advice, um, highlighting what can be done. Um, obviously, we know there's restrictions with security and, and the, the complications of bringing people to airfields uh, as large groups of schools and colleges and universities to be able to experience firsthand those types of um, days out, as it were. I mean, when I when I grew up, um, I'm still growing up, I hope, <laughs> but, um, you know, I started uh, visiting the airfield, thankfully, because of the environment that aviation was at the time from the age of five or six, being able to go to an airfield you know a, a big airfield such as Gatwick um not far from us um watch the planes from a spectator balcony I know the security impact of that now is is, is harder um but you're enthused from a young age you know uh, there was ways to be able to visit places on the airfield at the time in a regulated manner uh to, to you know even at eight and ten you could go with cubs or scouts or beavers you know to be able to to experience those days whether it's visiting the fire station on the airfield or or going and seeing the air traffic control center or or going and seeing the terminals and, and the pushbacks that were happening and i think my generation um you know mid to late 30s now but the people that were involved and in, around the airfields they have some format of getting involved in an airfield without necessarily a major brand taking the lead in doing so um but i do think that that would excite people into coming into this sector um without indoctrinating you know it's just a see if you like it the same could be said for many sectors medical um transport um civil engineering you know uh computing it's it, 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 all these companies and, and 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 industries could do such things but i do think it would be a something worth investing in if they could look at a younger audience and how they can appeal to the younger audience in a way that reaches to them rather than having to be reached you know reaching to the clients or, or, or the, the the airfields or the the industry because um it's it's a lot easier for them to be able to 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 work on other sectors or be interested in other sectors because they're all around us aviation are in particular parts of the uk and so you've got to bring them in how do you attract them and i think that's one of the ways of doing it you know as a you know when i talk to some of the um 
colleges that I've been involved in, in regards of um, a part of business groups, community groups, um, as business, you know, personnel that come in and, and appreciate what the local um, colleges are doing uh, to try and help and to, to excite candidates about opportunities, not just on the airfield, but in varying businesses that these uh, business leaders uh, represent. Uh, I think it'd be great if, you know, markets could look at this and say, actually, we would like to come and visit you. Would there be an opportunity to, um, you know, basically support uh, uh, and show you what we can do in an arranged manner? You know, in, in, whether it's a, a visit to the airport organised in a in a timely fashion, or it's a come to the the schools, the universities, the colleges, which I'm sure some do. But I just think there needs to be more of it because that's the way you're probably going to backfill some of the skills gap at this present time because it will get the the youth thinking about do I go into that sector or not? I really enjoyed that conversation we had with that person that came to visit us. So I think it, it's it's a it's a nice way of planting the seed and giving them the opportunity to think actually I never thought about that and maybe that's one way we could progress with that. And in terms of retainment, I mean, what can the industry do to retain those staff? I mean, I I spoke to the CEO of Donata, Steve Allen, last week. Um, in Dubai. And, you know, he was talking about this very issue and said that nowadays, you know, people will stay in the industry for three, four years, and then they'll move on. And I suppose, you know, again, it's well documented that young people nowadays will have several careers within their working lives, rather yeah. than, I suppose, 20, 30, and longer years ago, you know, people would join an industry, and they would stay there for their, you know, the rest of their working lives. And, it, mm -hmm. you know, it's very different nowadays with new technology, social media, you know, people, young people will jump from career to career. So that seems in itself a whole, you know, challenge in itself on top of the need to retain. So, I mean, yeah, I, I what, agree. But... what can the industry do to to ensure that they keep these, you know, these staff? I think I think to be fair, as I mentioned in, in the in the previous, I think the the diversification um, and career path is not just about financial. Um, it is it is really a case of where can I go from what I've been doing? What can I add to a brand uh, or my my CV, um, my own personal contentment for you know. Uh, for where I want to be headed now, I've had this sort of gap, as it were, you know, a pause that we all were paused to an extent um, about where I want to go with my career. Um, I think you'll find that, you know, there's companies which are really looking to retain that 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 skill set by obviously using what those individuals have existingly, but offering training courses, offering qualifications offering new or diversified roles from what they've previously been doing, but utilising the skill sets they've already gained in that. So they feel and understand that they are moving on within their career path within the same brand. Um, I also think, you know, there's, I, I mean, I take take pride in the fact that imparting knowledge as best as I can do, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've been in varying different areas of the sector over the last sort of 18 years. Um, and I've had three or four different areas of the sector that I've worked in. Um, and to be able to impart that knowledge onto new and, and sort of empower people to think, actually, I might, want, I would like to go for a role that you previously done. Can you tell me about it? Um, I think there's a lot of sort of colleague sharing of information there, which which, which should lead to people wanting to stay involved. Um, you know, I think people can get disheartened in any sector. Um, I think they can be a bit tired of what happens in their sectors, respectively, um, thinking that, that, you know, it's the same old churn. I've got 15 years left. I've got 10 years left. And, you know, do I sit here or do I look to do something else um, and see if I ha add value and be valued as much or more so elsewhere? Um, but I think, you know, it re the way that companies are at the moment with regards to the people that they have retained, um, they are fully well aware of making sure that they feel valued because, you know, like you mentioned in that that company, Donata, um, that they have a very big emphasis on making sure that the people feel valued from entry point um, uh, within the business ongoing. Um, you know, the, it's, it's very interesting to see, you know, um, clients when they produce sort of um, information about their onboarding, you know, and showing them about their business and their brand. And, and it, you know, I think there has been a real push of late to appreciate the existing people within their own companies, um, knowing full well that they are the lifeblood of that business. You know, without those particular roles, they, they don't function, certified or uncertified. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that people are starting to feel evidently more valued 
they'll see that in probably in their pay. Um, and that is nothing that, you know, I would say recruitment have got any uh, input into. Uh, I'm sure negotiations understandably happen between particular offers as such, like between a client and a candidate. But I generally think um, the market is trying to say, look, we have been behind on what we are paying um, and we need to be cost competitive. And yes, there is a financial benefit to you staying with us, but we are also going to introduce these things in order to make you feel a bit more involved and valued from a, a different sense. Um, and I think, you know, uh, giving them the ability to train, diversify and and people move within uh, areas of the company, um, I'm seeing a lot more now. Well, Alex, it's been fascinating um, talking to you. This is a, you know, a huge topic and, um, you know, perhaps we'll just have to wait for your lava lamp analogy and, and see, you know, in the next five, 10 years where this develops but um yeah thank it's, you. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you for uh spending the time with us hopefully um some of the insight helps and uh, obviously open to to um contributing more in regards of uh, any information that i pick up as we go but like i say it's uh it's a it's a challenging market out there but at the same point in time it's a really rewarding sector to be a part of and i really do urge people that are considering coming into aviation and aerospace um to to really consider you know have a look give us a call and and, and see if we can help them any way we can Thank you to everyone who listened to this episode. This has been the Aviation Briefing with me, William Hallowell.